This video is going to be about uh, chapter one, section two of our textbook, um, a discussion of uh, the various eras of prehistory and what human life was like during those times. Before we talked about in chapter 1.1, how we got to human beings, homo sapiens. Um, now we're gonna talk about what their lives were like in this era that we call prehistory. So the first thing we need to remind ourselves is how do we define the concept of prehistory? And you may remember prehistory is the era of human history before the invention of writing. Okay. We generally can divide prehistory into lots of different sort of subsections or sub eras. Um, and for our purposes in our class, we are going to split prehistory into two different time periods. The first is what's called the Old Stone Age or the Paleolithic era. And you can see the Greek words that give us that name uh, on the slide there. And uh, the New Stone Age or the Neolithic era. Okay, um, These can often be subdivided into early and late or middle and upper and lower Stone Ages. Um, but for our purposes, we're only going to do a two-part division. We're going to say Paleolithic, Old Stone, from 2 million BC to about 10,000 BC, and the Neolithic era from about 10,000 BC until the end of prehistory, which um, gets variously divided up. Some people say it's as early as 4,500 BC. Others say 2,000 BC. Um, these dates are not particularly important for our purposes, but understanding that there's these two halves, Paleolithic and Neolithic, uh, that is important. So the first thing we need to discuss is the Paleolithic era. What was human existence like during the Paleolithic era? This is the first and longest era of human existence. So we have, if you're looking at our, our civilization as a whole, as humans, our species as a whole, we have spent the most amount of our time in the Paleolithic era, okay? Um, during this time, we were primarily using stone as our most valuable tool material, hence the name lithic stone uh, era. It's not the only tool though, um, but it's sort of the pinnacle or the best material that we can use as far as uh, tool materials goes. Our lives in the Paleolithic era were nomadic, meaning that we were constantly moving from place to place. We did not take up a residence in a fixed location. Um, instead, we were always moving, right? Um, we might stay in one region for a little bit, but eventually we're always moving on. And the reason we were moving was because we were always following our food, whether that means uh, animals, which are literally moving from place to place as they follow their food, or whether we would use up the plant resources in an area and then have to move on to find new plant resources that hadn't been harvested before. So our nomadic uh, ways were primarily due to our need to constantly move to find food. Okay. Humans didn't live by themselves in this era. Uh, they lived with other humans. Um, and typically those groups would be of about 20 to 30 other people. So 20 to 30 humans working together as they move from place to place to place. The possessions uh, that humans had were very few and very light. The reason being that the more stuff you have, the harder it is to be mobile. Um, so having very few possessions and having uh, possessions that were very easy to carry made it a lot easier for uh, you as a nomadic society to be moving around. Um, we do know that while um, uh, we are often moving around, we didn't just sort of sleep out under the open sky all the time. Um, early humans would live in uh, their own structures that they would build, um, uh, temporary structures, or um, they would find uh, like a cave or a, a place where um, uh, they would be able to sort of temporarily stay without having to do the hard work of setting things up for themselves. Um, it's important to note that the stereotype of cavemen is not really true, the idea of humans permanently living in caves. Um, we may have stayed there temporarily as a, as a piece of convenience, um, but once our food ran out in that area, we didn't have any reason to stick around in that area. So um, uh, the idea of cavemen is a bit of a misnomer. 
Humans during the Paleolithic era eventually developed language. Um, we have some evidence for them learning to sail, uh, uh, as in from place to place on the ocean. Probably not deep sea sailing, but just sailing close to the shore, probably. Uh, we see evidence of a religious system, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and we see uh, that the primary means of living was what we would now call a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which we'll talk about now. So the hunter-gatherer lifestyle is where we have these two separate labor roles, uh, hunting and gathering, uh, which were primarily defined by gender. Okay, Males were responsible for hunting, fishing, scavenging, basically looking for live or dead animals. And females were responsible for the gatherer part of that lifestyle, gathering fruits, vegetables, roots, leaves, um, staying closer to home base, as it were, um, without having to follow or track animals around. Now, most people, when they think about this sort of Stone Age lifestyle, they have the impression that um, uh, hunters would be the more uh, upper class, more powerful, the more um, uh, socially relevant group but it's actually the reverse. And it's actually females in these hunter-gatherer societies who had higher status and were more important socially and had more power. And the reason is uh, gathering is a much more reliable source of food. Hunting may bring in a big kill, but it comes with all of the danger of, of, of being involved in that hunt and there's no guarantee that you're going to bring in an animal every day. Um, we don't have the sophisticated hunting tools and the hunting strategies. Um, if you're looking for just the most easy to get, most reliable sources of food, that was brought in by gatherers who are females. And so if you're bringing in more food, that means you have more power in the society. We talk about the, the idea of bringing home the bacon, right? The person who provides. Um, and if you're the one responsible for bringing in the food, you theoretically should have more power, more status in a society. So women would have a higher status level in these societies because they are the primary people who are bringing in more food, which is ensuring the survival of the species. Um, this also uh, uh, sort of has a secondary effect that women typically have a higher status, but then also um, women have more power in the religious side of things in uh, early human societies. Um, more on that in a second. Now, of course, this lifestyle um, is uh, the reason why the lifestyle is set up the way it is, is because of the physiological or physical differences between men and women. There's a feature of many species of animals on the planet called sexual bimorphism or sexual dimorphism. This is a quality where um, different genders of the same species have different physical forms. So traditionally, on average, male humans are taller and have more muscle mass than females who are typically shorter and have certain other physical characteristics that they tend towards. Okay? Um, this ensures that um, men tended to be more successful at hunting because they were bigger and stronger overall, generally, right? Um, and therefore, that's why most males tended to fall into the hunting role, okay? So you may ask, why are the, the roles divided by gender? And it just has to do with, on average, men were better suited to doing this certain job. Therefore, societies that were successful, the ones that lived, and the ones that passed on their way of life to other groups that then followed them uh, were the ones who split the roles by genders based on which gender was best able to do which role. Okay. Um, so um, uh, this lifestyle that we see here was extremely closely connected to the natural world. Um, you're obviously following your food sources, so your connection to your ability to get your food is based on the animals and the plants that you're looking for. And you have to be aware of the seasons and the migrations of animals. Um, the only resources, resources that you have are the resources that nature provides for you. So obviously all the stuff that you're getting for your tools, stone and timber and hides and stuff all comes from nature. Um, and of course, you know, if there's a natural disaster or something happens, 
uh, in the natural world, then that has a huge ripple effect on human society. Um, and a single drought or a single flood can completely wipe out a human population just because of a loss of resources. This leads me into the next point on this slide here, where it talks about how humans at this point were living a hand-to-mouth existence. Um, hand-to-mouth existence refers to the fact that the minute that you find something, the minute you grab a piece of food, you're stuffing it in your mouth um, because you don't know where your next meal is coming from. You barely are surviving as it is. And it's not a great way to live. It's a very, very, very tenuous way to live. Your survival is in no way guaranteed in this hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Um, and as a result, these populations were very, very limited in their ability to sustain themselves. Um, different groups of humans would have to fight each other for resources because resources are so scarce. Um, if a group of humans starts to get too big, that 20 to 30 number starts to get closer to 40, um, you might have to um, uh, expose, um, uh, lose um, infants. Um, if a baby is born and it can't be pr protected by the group, it can't be cared for, provided for, they might leave that child out in the wilderness to, to essentially die um, because having another mouth to feed was going to put too much pressure on the rest of the group. Um, and sometimes if a group got too big, some of the younger would have to break away and create their own new groups um, in order to um, ensure the survival of both of these groups. So this is a very difficult era of human history. It is not sort of a time where we can sit around and enjoy life. It's, it's a constant struggle to survive because the hunter-gatherer lifestyle is not a reliable source of food. Um, it's a hand-to-mouth existence that puts a lot of pressure on your ability to survive. These humans, though, did have some interesting things going on in their culture, if we can call it that. Um, we know, for instance, that Paleolithic humans had a, a sort of uh, really uh, vaguely defined sense of, of religion. Um, they engaged in ceremonial burial. They would bury their dead with items, with grave goods, stuff. Um, and of course, that points to the fact that they must have been thinking about death and the afterlife, right? Why would you bury um, some other human with an object that you could use as a tool for yourself? Well, the answer is you must think that that person, that dead person needs this for some reason um, in the afterlife. Um, or at the very least, you think that they need to be honored in some way. We know that they believed in a form of religion that was called animism, um, which comes from the Latin word anima, which means something like spirit. Um, and basically this boiled down to the idea that every thing in the world, tree, rock, river, animal, had some kind of spirit that was associated with it. Um, and it's a very kind of vague and poorly defined sense of religion. There's no sort of God in the heavens that looks out for all of us and cares about us. It's just that there are these spirits that keep the world alive. So it's a very primitive form of religion. Um, but what's important is that there is some form of religion at this point in uh, the Paleolithic human world. There may have been some form of shamans that worked in the society. Um, a shaman is sort of like a, a special religious figure who um, sort of acts as an intermediary between the human world and the divine world. Um, they kind of can read the future and they see what the spirits want. Um, uh, the image that you see on the screen here is, is a potential shaman character from a cave painting, a Paleolithic cave painting. Um, and you can see it's kind of a weird mix of human and animal. It's got animal-like qualities, but then like the human feet there at the bottom. Um, so a character that kind of can commune with the spirits of the animals in the world, but also is part man, um, has some sort of mystical quality to it. Um, all of this points to some sort of idea that there may have been people who were specifically in charge of religion in the Paleolithic world. Um, but all of it, you know, regardless of what the shamans exactly are, um, is a sign of intellectual development, that these humans living in the Paleolithic era were not sort of just dumb brutes, um, but that they were thinking about bigger questions. What happens to you after you die? Why do things live? What happens to animals when they die? 
you know, is the tree alive? These are big questions that our earliest human ancestors were thinking about even at this time in the Paleolithic period. And so we should never ever characterize them as just a bunch of brutes or dumb idiots. Um, they are us, they are humans just like us. And they're just starting on the road to figuring out these big ideas that we sort of take for granted nowadays. All right, I wanna take a pause here and we'll have a separate video that talks about uh, religion, specifically with regard to how females play into uh, Paleolithic religion. So until then, that's all for now.